Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, listeners. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of the podcast. Have you ever been asked a question about COVID that has no basis in reality? On April 2nd, Josh Sharfstein appeared on the Washington Journal segment of C-SPAN to talk about the podcast and answer questions from callers live on TV. These questions were not vetted in advance, and many stem from misinformation that's proliferated online. Every question deserves an answer, and so we thought you might like to hear how Dr. Sharfstein responded live and unscripted. Today, we're replaying parts of the C-SPAN broadcast as part of a bonus episode. Let's listen. I got a question. Why the hell do we need the vaccine in the first place? People through sorcery, witchcraft. This is all written in the Bible. Microchip days, 666 days later, the actual pandemic was declared. I'm not the captain. I'm not the captain. We got your point. Let's get a let's get a response. Dr. Sharfstein, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. All right, let's take some calls. Uh, Susan is our first caller for this segment in uh, Los Angeles, California. Hi, Susan. Hi. Uh, Hello, doctor. I was calling to find out if the um, rise in the new variant is connected to the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab and microchipping the public in order to tie into the new banking system. Um, Well, thank you for that question. I do not think so. Um, These variants form because every time someone gets infected, the virus is uh, replicating millions and millions of times. And every time it does that, it has to copy itself. And every time it does that, it can make errors. The copies aren't perfect because we're talking about many things that have to be done. And so you're constantly getting mutations in the virus in every single person who's getting sick. Every so often, we sort of lose the lottery. A new virus comes out that actually takes over and is easier to transmit from person to person. The most important thing to do to prevent that from happening is to reduce the number of infections. And so that's why it's so important to vaccinate so you don't get sick in the first place. You don't become a little factory for the virus yourself. Um, And it's also really important to vaccinate the world. We're just not safe if there are so many infections in other parts of the world where variants can be forming. All right, let's talk to Marty in Richfield, Wisconsin. Hi, Marty. Uh, Good morning, and thank you for John Hopkins. You have done a pretty nice job of tracking the infections around the world. What I'm not hearing is about all the adverse effects, people dying all over the world. And where is the talk about therapeutics? Please, please, the vaccines are now being proven on many, many websites and people tracking it that the vaccines are not stopping transmission. What are you talking about? Why are you trying to press a vaccine now on everybody in the whole world when it's not working? Sure. Well, you know, I think I agree in part and disagree in part. So I appreciate the question. You know, where I agree is I do think therapeutics are important. You're absolutely right that vaccines are not 100% effective in stopping transmission. In fact, for Omicron, they're, you know, maybe 50% effective in stopping transmission of the virus. 50% is better than nothing, but it means that you absolutely can see transmission in highly vaccinated populations. So that means we need additional steps. We need therapeutics. There's some very good uh, medications. The federal government has been uh, buying them. And the important thing about therapeutics, the therapeutics that work, is you have to get the treatment quickly. So you have to be tested early when you have symptoms, and then you have to be able to get to the treatment. I am absolutely in favor of therapeutics during that period. Now, quickly, the part that I disagree about is that just because vaccines are not 100% in stopping transmission, doesn't mean that vaccines are no good. In fact, what matters most is not getting very sick or dying. And for that, vaccines are extraordinarily effective. 
We might disagree a little bit on vaccines, and I feel very confident based on all of the evidence out there on vaccines. We agree on therapeutics. We need both. All right. Peter is next in Erie, Pennsylvania. Hello, Peter. Good morning. I've had COVID twice, uh, earlier in the pandemic, and then uh, I had a breakthrough case uh, after I had you know, received the three vaccination series. I was privileged to go to high school with an internationally recognized epidemiologist. He said, you don't really need the booster. I guess my question is, why aren't voices like that really recognized in this conversation? Obviously, his position, you know, is the opposite of yours, is the opposite of the government. Uh, And I think it's legitimate. You know, I don't think it's the exact opposite of what I'm saying at all, actually. When this last uh, second booster was authorized, it was authorized to be made available for people over 50. But there's not a extreme push for people to get that second booster. It's available. Why is it available? It's available because there's no question a lot of people can benefit. It's also true that having had COVID provides some protection. We don't know how much. And for any individual, it could be quite variable. This is complicated. I think in general, we do better with things that are very simple. I mean, I do better with things that are very simple. Either do it or don't do it. And sometimes there are things that are a little bit more complicated. And in this case, I think it's very, very easy to say, get the primary series because it is enormously helpful in reducing hospitalization and death. I think it's actually very simple to say, particularly for people who are older and immunocompromised, get that first booster. As you get to the second booster, there's not as much data on that. There's a good reason to believe that it's effective. I think it's appropriate for someone to talk to their doctor to read and decide whether they want to run to get the second booster, walk to get the second booster, perhaps wait a little bit to get the second booster. You know, I I don't think that we have to line up on sides and say that either you're this or you're completely opposite. I think what we should say is we should use evidence to guide decisions like this, that there are going to be areas for judgment, that this question of somebody like yourself who has gotten the primary series, thank you for doing that, has gotten a booster. I think that was a smart move and has also gotten sick. You know, do you need the second booster now? I think that that, that's a judgment call. I think I could have a perfectly reasonable conversation with that epidemiologist from your hometown, and we probably would agree more than we disagreed a lot more. All right, Kevin is next in Galleon, Ohio. Hi, Kevin. Hi, I just have a comment. Um, Back in uh, May of 2015, May 15th, 2018, I'm sorry, John Hopkins carried out what they called a global pandemic exercise. And I just want people to be aware that exactly 666 days later, on March the 11th, 2020, the actual pandemic was declared. Um, why exactly was it 666 days? And I want people to be aware that this is all written in the Bible. Revelations chapter 18, 23, they deceive people through sorcery, pharmakia, witchcraft, black magic. These people are putting something into your body that makes you no longer redeemable. Get blood washed, not brainwashed. Thank you. Doctor, any comment on that? Um, Well, I haven't heard that before. Um, I'll be honest with you. You know, actually, the School of Public Health has a group called the Center for Health Security that does different simulations of different kinds of pandemics uh, with some frequency. In fact, the most recent one, I think, was right before the pandemic started. One of the interesting things is that the idea that a pandemic could happen has been known. I appreciate, you know, everybody's deeply held views and particularly religious beliefs. And I hope that they can be compatible with taking actions to protect yourself and your families. People who turn their back on tremendous amounts of scientific evidence for whatever reason are putting themselves and their families in grave danger. That's why some of the, you know, most outspoken people against vaccines who just, you know, boasted about not getting vaccines and had every manner of theory for why they were unnecessary. Many of those people have died from COVID. It doesn't make me happy when I hear that, even though I disagree with those people. It makes me very sad. I I really hope that people can see that it's possible to have strong beliefs about things and also 
Look at the evidence, hear from your own doctor, your own hospital about what really matters and take steps that can make all the difference for yourself and your family. All right. Jim is in Arlington, Virginia. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? Hi, good morning. So I I have a quick question. It's regarding the availability of other COVID-19 vaccines in today's market. There's one by Novavax, the vaccine that's yet to be made available in the U.S., and I think a lot of people are still waiting on that. I've already gotten the, the first two doses, but I have not gotten my booster yet because I had some reactions to the uh, uh, my Moderna shots. So I'm kind of hesitant to get my booster with that same product. I would like to buy out something else. Can you just talk a little bit about why it's taking this long? Sure. So Novavax is a little bit different. It's based on a protein from the virus directly being in the vaccine, unlike the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer Moderna, which have the messenger RNA, which basically allows your cells to create the protein. It's a vaccine technology that has been used for other kinds of vaccines. It is harder for it to be made, which is why it's taken so long to be manufactured at at a scale. And also it took longer to be studied. Your second question was, Would that be a good choice for someone who had a reaction to the mRNA vaccines? It could well be a good choice. I think that totally makes sense. But uh, that your last question was, well, why isn't it available? And I think uh, that's a fair question to ask. Uh, The Food and Drug Administration does a very, very careful review of the data from all of these vaccines as they did for the mRNA vaccines. Um, The FDA is one of the only regulatory agencies in the world that It doesn't take the results from the companies at face value, actually reanalyzes the data itself. And when you do that, um, you get an independent look at what the data shows. And sometimes that lines up with what the companies um, presented, but sometimes it doesn't. But you really get the view of some extremely experienced people. And I used to work at the FDA and um, know them. And so they're doing that right now in the Novavax vaccine. And then what happens is they will present that publicly and we'll really get to see um, the best view of the data. Like you, I hope that that happens as quickly as possible. I have written and I believe that the FDA should be a little bit more forthcoming about the status of each of these vaccines. And for example, when vaccines will be available for young children, the status of the Novavax vaccine. Typically, FDA likes to be very quiet as products are being reviewed and then just come out at the end and say what the answer is. And I understand why they've done that typically, but I think in a pandemic and just in general in 2022, it's better for the FDA to be more communicative, to share more information. So I I would be with you in saying I'd like to know a little bit more about the status. All right. Daniel is next in Montana. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning. I uh, I got a question. Why the hell do we need the vaccine in the first place? I'm happy to answer that. (laughs) I think, you know, I think it's a fair question for people to ask. The coronavirus is brand new. You know, it came out of animals. It's brand new to humans. So we don't have immunity towards it. And it can cause severe illness and death. What the vaccine does is it trains our immune system to recognize something that we haven't seen before so that when we actually get exposed to the virus, our own immune system is prepared to fight it and kill that virus. It's like going in and, you know, saying, I know that there's somebody who is going to be coming to your house and here's exactly what you need to do. And so when somebody comes to your house, you're totally ready to defend your house. If your body is your house, the vaccine is training you to protect it. And when that happens, it means that right away, as soon as the virus comes, your immune system jumps into action and it kills the virus and you're much less likely to be hospitalized or die, much less likely. Almost everyone who's been dying in the United States has not been sufficiently vaccinated. And it's because their immune systems were not trained. You know, let me tell you, when I heard about a new virus and I thought, like, do I want to be running into a new virus totally unprepared? Or do I want to be running into a new virus with my immune system ready to kill it? Not a hard question. That's why you need a vaccine. That's why it makes so much of a difference. Safe and effective vaccines have saved millions and millions of lives. So there is a strong reason to do it. There's tons of evidence. And there's the actual evidence of people who are alive because of these vaccines. All right. Tom is next. Good morning, Tom. I wanted to ask, 
Dr. Joshua, a couple things. One, ivermectin was touted as the greatest medicine since aspirin and penicillin. Everybody can use it. Also, I got the monoclonal antibodies, and I got saved. I thought I was going to die within 12 hours. So why aren't we pushing the uh, ivermectin? Why is the government getting in between me and my doctor? He cannot prescribe this stuff when it's a normal, typical medicine. Thank you. I think that's a very understandable question. And I absolutely believe in therapeutics. It's not just about vaccines. It's vaccines and therapeutics because some people will get sick and we have to do the best to help them. But my view is that therapeutics should have evidence for them. We don't want to give people medications or injections that don't work for a couple reasons. One is it can cause side effects without any benefit. And the other reason is you can waste very valuable time. If you're trying something that doesn't work, you're losing the opportunity to take a medicine that works. Monoclonal antibodies work for the virus that they're matched to. You have to match the monoclonal antibody to the virus. Sometimes certain monoclonal antibodies don't work for certain variants of the virus. But when the match is there, it's incredibly effective. I mean, there's no question. That's why in Baltimore, the health commissioner was supporting it, the health secretary of the state of Maryland. We have the National Guard giving monoclonal antibodies to people whose lives can be saved. And that's because there's evidence that when there's a match, you save someone's life if you get them that monoclonal antibody quickly enough. So I'm totally in favor of that. Now, what about the things that we don't know whether it works? Well, then you have to do a study. And so the studies have been done on ivermectin and the studies were done on hydroxychloroquine. And those medicines don't work. It's not a good idea for people to take them. And I think that the role of the government in this circumstance is to help get the evidence that tells people what works. I don't feel protected if I don't know what works, you know, and I'm just listening to people who frankly often have a vested interest telling me, oh, come here, try this. You know, we had this kind of medical system in the United States at the turn of the 20th century in the early 1900s. We had a system where people said, you know, try Dr. Josh's pills for this. They work. And people would run and everybody would take Dr. Josh's pills and a lot of them would die. And we decided as a country that what matters isn't just having access to medicines, it's having access to medicines that work. That's what's been the big progress. That's why we can treat all these cancers now. That's why we can have treatments for high blood pressure and heart failure and all these things is because we said, let's get the evidence on whether or not it works. And the same is true for COVID. I do not think that just having access to treatments, particularly those that don't work, is necessary. And in fact, I think it's actually harmful to people in harm's right. way. Dr. Sh- uh, Joshua Sharfstein, we are at a time. Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, the host of Public Health On Call podcast. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thanks so much for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes Fernandez and Amber Bryan Singletary. Thank you for listening. Thank you.